Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, no, I am not the keynote speaker. My name is Silverstraat, and I am an executive board member of European Students for Liberty, and I am, besides Jael Osowski, who opened the conference, the second Master of Ceremonies, or MC, for this weekend. As good libertarians, we thought we should have a little bit of competition, so Jael and I are duking it out. There might even be some singing involved later. But before we ever get to that... Before we get to that, I have the great honor and pleasure to introduce our first keynote for the third annual European Students for Liberty conference. Matt Kibe will be speaking to us about don't hurt people and don't take their stuff, which seems fairly logical but becomes very difficult whenever politicians get involved. <laughs> Mr. Kibe is the president and CEO of Freedom Works, which is a brilliant grassroots organization that collect, connects lovers of individual liberty, trains volunteers, mobilizes them, and has successfully assisted in many campaigns in the United States. He is a trained economist, a policy expert, and a regular guest on CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC, which says a lot, if you ask me. He's written Hostile Takeover, Resisting Centralized Government Stranglehold on America, and co-authored New York Times' number one bestseller, Give Us Liberty, a Tea Party Manifesto. But besides all of this, there is also a lighter side to Mr. Kibe, as he is well known for wonkish pronouncements regarding music and a well-known fan of craft beers. He is also known for his very particular style in looks. As Slate, mag Slate Magazine described, he looks like Billy Thornton, but cleaned up for a job interview. So it will also not surprise you that if you type in Mr. Kibe's name in Google, the second search suggestion that you will get is sideburns. To sum it up, Mr. Kibe is the perfect man to open a student libertarian conference as he has a man of epic beer, epic sideburns, but most importantly, epic work in the liberty movement. So please give a hand to our first keynote. Such an honor to, for you guys to have me here. I've been able to watch <laughs> Students for Liberty for so many years, so many years. And what's crazy about what's going on is the exponential growth of this room. I think it's probably true that this organization doubles in size every year. Is that about right? Will we do that next year? What a burden. <laughs> Things are growing so fast, and liberty is trending. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, because everybody in this audience has taken, taken up a, a responsibility. This is no longer just a cool place to hang out, maybe meet your, your new wife, <laughs> um, maybe go clubbing later. If you guys haven't noticed, Everybody's paying attention to us now, and that's an awesome thing. Everybody's paying attention to what we do. It's a huge opportunity. We see this monumental clash going on all across the world, certainly in the United States, where I'm from, between centralization and liberty. And yet this room doubles in size every year. That tells you that there's a responsibility on your shoulders. You're a little bit like Atlas, right? You're holding the weight of freedom on your shoulders. But, but we can't shrug. We cannot do that. Because liberty is too precious. It's too important that we succeed in what we're doing. Now, I'm an old man compared to everybody in this audience. And if you know anything about old men, we tell stories about ourselves. So I'm going to tell you a story about myself and some of you guys have heard this, but bear with me just for a second, because there's actually a point to this. When I was uh, younger than you are today, we didn't have MP3 files. We didn't have iTunes. We used to go to the record store, a bricks and mortar record store, and we would buy vinyl albums. It's hard to imagine today. And the cool thing about buying a vinyl album is you get, you, you'd go home, it would be a ritual, you'd take the plastic off that cover, you'd, you'd drop the table, and you'd open the, the little thing, and you'd read the liner notes in the album. 
And when I was 13 years old, I bought an album by a band called Rush. Has anyone ever heard of the band called Rush? A couple. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I'd heard it in, in, in my high school. But this was an album called 2112, and I was listening to it. It's an awesome album. If you haven't heard it, you need to. But more importantly, you should read the liner notes. I was 13, I'm reading the liner notes, dedicated to Ayn Rand. I'm like, who is Ayn Rand? I had no idea, I was 13. But the album rocked. And so I played it again and again and again, and over time, I, I, every time I'd go to the record store, I'd try to find other Rush albums, but it was very difficult to find another album by the band called Rush. Why? Because in those days, Everything was top down. You only had a couple choices, and it was usually driven by the music industrial complex, and they would tell you to like really awesome bands like Andy Gibb, or maybe Barbra Streisand. At the time that Rush, the Rush album 2112 came out, the number one album in America was an insipid disco version of the Cantina Bar song from Star Wars. <laughs> And you were expected to listen to that. And it was a bit of a, a tyrannical thing because you didn't have any choice. And what you didn't know was what you wanted, but you couldn't find it. But somehow I found Rush. I was at a used garage sale about a year later, still thinking to myself, who is this Ayn Rand? And I stumbled across a used book called Anthem. It's really beat up. It was an old copy. It was earmarked. Um, I took it home. I devoured it. It was the most awesome book I'd ever read. And I immediately started looking for other books by Ayn Rand. My copy of Anthem was so old that Atlas Shrugged had not been conceived of yet. So it said, other books by Ayn Rand, The Fountainhead. I started looking for The Fountainhead. Do you have any idea how hard it is to find a copy of The Fountainhead in 1980? You drive from one bookstore to another to another. It wasn't there. Somehow I found it. I devoured it. I started reading all of her other stuff, again and again and again, trying to find these books in a, in a local bookstore. And she said in, her, in one of her nonfiction books, read Ludwig von Mises. So I did. And I'm, I'm 17 years old. I have no idea what I'm doing. I read Human Action. By the way, if you're 17, don't quote Ludwig von Mises to girls. They don't dig it at all. <laughs> I don't even know what I was reading, but it, it, seemed, it seemed like I was pursuing this, these ideas that, that made sense when I first read that book called Anthem. And then I accidentally moved to Grove City, Pennsylvania. I accidentally went to Grove City College. I accidentally discovered a year after I'd been enrolled at Grove City College that the chairman of the economics department at my school was one of the few gentlemen to receive a PhD from Ludwig von Mises, a guy named Hans Senholz. I didn't know that. The economics department teaching Austrian economics, which I had already read, was about 100 yards from, from my biology classes, which I was hating, but I did not know that was there. It wasn't until a well-beveraged evening with a friend of mine, Peter Betke, we'd had about a dozen beers, having an argument about the proper role of government. You can imagine how many girls were at that party. <laughs> and he said to me, why aren't you in the economics department? I didn't know. Think about the veil of ignorance that's been, been dropped in front of all of us as we discover these ideas. Think about the exponential growth of the community in this room here, and think about the upwards potential of where we can be. Another guy that I know happens to be a U.S. congressman now, a guy named Justin Amash. Has anyone paid any attention to Justin Amash? He was speaking in just, just last week at the International Students for Liberty. Um, Justin Amash went to college without ever hearing about liberty or Austrian economics. He went to law school, and you'll be shocked to know that they did not teach Ludwig von Mises or Frederick Hayek 
before he went to law school. One day he realized that he wasn't quite a Republican and he couldn't figure out why. He certainly wasn't a Democrat, because de Democrats tend towards a, a big government solution to everything. But he wasn't feeling like he was a Republican either, either. So you know what he did? He Googled it. He typed in what he was thinking and up popped F.A. Hayek. So he starts reading Hayek and he starts reading Mises. If you go to Justin Amash's office, in the U.S. Congress today in the Cannon Building. He has a picture of Murray Rothbard on his wall. Carl Menger, who here knows who Carl Menger is? So you guys know the secret handshake, that's awesome. <laughs> How on earth did we get a congressman, an elected official, who actually understands liberty? And by the way, he's not alone. He runs the Liberty Caucus in the U.S. House of Representatives. And he also has some, some friends on the Senate side, guys you may know, guys like Rand Paul. How did Justin Amash get elected to the U.S. Congress? He was opposed by the GOP establishment. The business community didn't want him to win that election. But he was able to connect with a community based on a set of ideas who had discovered liberty just the way he did. They Googled it. Or someone that was a Facebook friend sent them something, or they read a tweet, and all of a sudden, this exponential community, some call it the Tea Party, some call it the Liberty Movement, some call it something else, emerged in his swing district in Michigan that enabled him to do something that could not have been done just five, 10 years ago. He won an election by talking about liberty. Today, he's being primaried by a GOP establishment candidate heavily funded by the local Chamber of Commerce, and he is crushing that guy. Why is that? How is that possible? Because the rules of politics, just like the rules of learning, just like the way that I discovered the ideas of liberty, everything is changing, everything is disrupting, everything is better than it was before. This is a huge opportunity. I was at uh, something called CPAC last week, conservative I don't even know what it stands for. Let's say Conservative Political Action Committee. Um, by far the most popular speaker was Rand Paul. Rand Paul is a serious candidate for President of the United States. And he quoted Pink Floyd. <laughs> How awesome is that? It doesn't get much cooler than that. I hadn't thought about my favorite band when I was 13, Rush, for quite some time until I saw an article in the Huffington Post describing that this, this upstart candidate who was running for Senate in Kentucky, a guy named Rand Paul, was playing Rush at his, at his uh, campaign events. I'm like, that guy must be pretty cool. Of course, he won against the GOP establishment's pick. Mitch McConnell, the uh, Republican leader, spent all of his energy trying to elect another gentleman named Trey Grayson. You guys know the end of that story. What you may not know is that Trey Grayson is currently the co-chairman of a Democratic super PAC with that great free market economist Robert Reich as his co-chairman. So how is it that the Republican Party has Rand Paul and a guy that is co-chairman of a super PAC with Robert Reich? Surely there's a clash there. Surely there's something different going on. Surely there's a way that we th that believe in liberty have a seat at the table in Washington, D.C. like we've never had before. And I think we're just getting started. And you watch what's happening in 2014. I won't make any wild predictions, but there are more liberty candidates running for more seats in this next coming cycle than I've ever seen before. And they're going to join a caucus in the House, a caucus in the Senate, that actually know who Ludwig von Mises is, who actually understand the principles of liberty. And this is a burden. We have a seat at the table. You guys have a seat at the table. And, I, and that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit. We have this unbelievable opportunity to change the world in a way that I could not have conceived of when I was your age. When I was a young libertarian, you could fit all of us in a Volkswagen bus. 
It was literally that small. And finding those other dozen people that thought just like you was, was a huge hassle. You couldn't do it. Today, you just have to post it on Facebook. And you get those exponential, that exponential growth that, that so eluded us back then. But we have to stop talking to our, each other. And I was trying to figure out a way to do this after I saw a recent New York Times article, front page article with Rand Paul's picture there, which is just a vicious hit piece on libertarianism. Did anyone happen to see that piece? You guys matter enough now that the New York Times is writing hit pieces on what you believe. This is a responsibility, this is a burden. So being old and being humble, I decided that I would take it upon myself to translate all of libertarian thinking, thousands of years of Judeo-Christian thinking, Adam Smith, Frederick Hayek, a little bit of karma, a little bit of the big Lebowski, try to translate that all into what I call rules for liberty. And obviously, you know the punchline here. For all of our fancy jargon, why don't we just tell people what we believe? Don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. First rule for liberty is don't hurt people. Murray Rothbard talks about the non-aggression axiom, right? in a way that no normal person could possibly understand it. Why do we say that? What is the non-aggression axiom? Why don't we say, don't hurt people unless they mess with you? And why don't we apply that not only to the common sense, you don't hurt your neighbor, um, you don't hassle people, you expect to be left alone, but why don't we apply that to a more humble understanding of foreign policy? Should we get involved everywhere? Should we do everything for everybody? Should we have the presumption that we can re redesign other cultures from the top down? Or should we believe like George Washington did, that there's limits to foreign policy? Shouldn't hurt somebody unless they try to hurt you. You hear Rand Paul talk about this, you hear Justin Amash talk about it, you hear more and more people talking about this and getting applause, a standing ovation at CPAC. Couldn't happen five, 10 years ago. Wouldn't have happened five or 10 years ago. Rule number two, don't pe take people's stuff. I think, I think everybody gets this. I think everybody in our communities gets this. You don't steal from your neighbor. You don't steal your neighbor's, uh, from your neighbor's bank. You don't even steal your neighbor's identity online. But why is it when it comes to politics, we apparently think it's okay to outsource stealing to a third party? How is it okay if we're not allowed to steal from our neighbor, we can still steal from a third person and give that money to our neighbor? That's not cool. The fundamental principle of politics, I think, is this. There's either limited or unlimited stealing. And we're having this debate right now between those who think that government can be good, that you can elect the right people, that you can give the right people the discretion they need to do the right thing, and a great example of how that works is, is in the United States, our experiment with Obamacare, right? Completely discretionary program run by the very best people. They're so much smarter than you are. And yet, there are now more people uninsured in the United States than there were when we passed this plan. There are more people paying more for health insurance than before. So don't take people's stuff, it doesn't work and you can't trust third parties to do it. Rule number three, mind your own business. This is a tough one, particularly for conservatives and particularly for progressive liberals. They love to go to Washington. They love to take the levers of power and start telling other people how to live their lives. 
We've seen it in the drug war in the United States. We've seen it with the attempt to federalize the definition of marriage. And my question to you is, maybe you believe in traditional marriage. Maybe you believe in gay marriage. Maybe you don't care. But the important question when it comes to government power is, should you give the ability to a third party, the government, to define that for you? Maybe you like what Barack Obama thinks about the definition of marriage. But what are you going to think about President Ted Cruz when he defines marriage? Wouldn't it be better to let social institutions define marriage? Wouldn't it be letter, better to let people choose? Is this radical? Or am I scaring anybody in the room yet? This is where we should be. One more rule I want to talk about, and it's the most important one. Rule number six, fight the power. If we don't do this, nobody's going to do it for us. And we have this tremendous opportunity. And all of the rules of politics and all of the rules of government were always about keeping information behind closed doors. You never knew what they were doing. And that's the way they liked it. Economists call it rational ignorance, but we call it, I'm too busy with my life and my education and my kids and my family and my job and everything I have to do, I couldn't possibly have time to pay attention to what Washington, D.C. is doing to me, or Brussels, or fill in the blank. You never knew what they were doing until after they did it to you. It's different today. You can Google that thing. You can find out in real time what the politicians are proposing to do to you. If you think about the old rules, the iron rules of public choice and how different it is today, it used to be the case that concentrated benefits, who could afford information, who could afford their man in D.C., they controlled the process, and the rest of us didn't know. I think the Internet changes that. It levels the playing field. And guess what? I've done the math. There's more of us than there are of them. That's how we win. But I think for too many years, too many libertarians have sat out the political process. And maybe you want to, and I think that's cool if you do, because there's a thousand different ways to impact the world today in the realm of ideas, in the realm of organizing, in the realm of electing people that are connected to this community and these ideas. But if we don't show up, somebody else is going to show up. And government goes to the people that do. When I was a libertarian, we used to pride ourselves by being so pure that we weren't really comfortable until I chased every other single person out of the room. And then, you're, then it's victory, right? And you guys have been in these meetings when we argue about the most obtuse things. Um, instead of figuring out what those things we agree on, right? I think today we have an opportunity to connect with every single person in the world who happens to be online that believes in freedom. And if you know anything about politics, that, that size community can change any culture, can change any political system, and can make anything happen. But we need to figure out what we do with this responsibility, how we communicate to other people, and how we build a winning movement for liberty. The good news for me is I don't have to do it, you guys do. I just get to watch as you guys try to figure out how to solve these, these seemingly unsolvable problems and this clash with so much government power and so much violence and so much force and so much top-down discretionary power trying to tell people how to live their lives. And all of the people that are pushing back. There's more of us now. And there's a lot more of us that are looking for these ideas. They're trying to find an answer to the problems that they see out there. And they don't see it in the Democratic Party. They don't see it in the Republican Party. 
But there is a set of ideas, a set of values that we all share that I think can connect with them. So I hope you'll join me in that. And I hope you understand that this opportunity has never existed before. And the burden is totally on your shoulders. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can everybody hear me now? Good. Okay, so my name is Josephine, and thank you for this interesting talk. I'm wondering, since you brought up the question of same-sex marriage, and then you talked about Rand Paul, and that why does the government, the national government, have to decide how to define marriage? And Rand Paul, on the social questions, I, I would say maybe he's not totally libertarian, mm -hmm. since he's quite conservative. But so if you have this point of view that the national government shouldn't decide the, uh, the notion of marriage, how is that different from the national government deciding on economic policies? Then why not say that the states themselves should do this? And do you find, my question is, do you find the social issues as important as the economic issues in the libertarian movement? That's a great question. I think uh, social issues are every bit as important as economic issues, with, with an important caveat. I think, I think that the, we're debating political philosophy now. We're not debating personal values. And I would like to draw a bright line between those two things. I think that government should, should be as, as little involved and as little things as possible. They're supposed to defend life, liberty, and property. They're not supposed to do anything else. And some of you are going to call me a sellout for even acknowledging those three things. <laughs> um, and I, I'm heavily influenced by Hayek on this issue, and he talks about the spontaneous evolution of institutions and how it is that people interacting on a voluntary basis solve all sorts of, of problems, and I think that's where our best values come from. The problem is when, when government then takes them and defines them and redefines them, and puts them up for a vote, they can corrupt the most important things in your life. So I would like a President of the United States that doesn't have an opinion, as far as the government is concerned, about marriage. Pro or against. I don't want them involved. And I think that's where Rand Paul is. I don't want to speak for him. Um, but I think that's where he is. Howdy. Hi. I'm Justin Hinton, some random American in Europe. Um, Mr. Kibbe, my question for you. As a man who works in politics, what advice would you give for those who are also looking to get into politics? Specifically, how dirty is too dirty? How do you keep between the fine line of being pragmatic versus sacrificing your philosophical beliefs? That is a great question too, and I, I don't think you should ever compromise on your fundamental principles if you want to get involved in politics. And if you do that, it's a slippery slope. You never, you never get back why you went there in the first place. But I also think there's a big difference between splitting the difference on somebody else's bad idea and splitting the difference on a budget that cuts two trillion or one trillion. I think that sort of compromise, if you want to call that a compromise, if that's moving the ball in the right direction, I think you're talking about hurting cats whenever you get involved in politics. You never get a consensus. You're trying to build a coalition of, of citizens who will get you 50 plus 1 percent of the vote, which means that potentially 49 percent of your constituents disagree with you on a lot of things. So I think, I think we need to understand the difference between compromising on fundamental principles, like don't hurt people and don't take their stuff, versus how do you get a $100 trillion national debt trending in the right direction? That's a tough enough question. Uh, Matthew Sinclair, um, you've built an incredible organization at FreedomWorks. There'll be a lot of people here who might want to start organizations of their own at some point. What would your top tip or top tips be to someone who's considering starting an organization to campaign uh, for liberty? That's a great question. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with FreedomWorks, we we're community organizers. We actually help activists, primarily volunteers, 
organize, not just in elections. I think elections are almost an afterthought to what community organizing is all about. It's all about creating a constituency for ideas. And you will notice in this era of decentralization that newspapers and companies and politicians all respond to voters and customers and eyeballs, right? So if you want to change the media narrative, create a community that can drive eyeballs to a fair story and ignore a bad story. If you want to impact a crony capitalist that is building a business model based on government largesse, do a boycott. Sounds like what the left has been doing for a long time. So the key to building grassroots is actually connecting people. That's why we spend most of our money on social media, to be honest with you. Um, we used to run TV ads. We used to do mass mailings. We used to hire um, really expensive field people in all 50 states to meet people one at a time. But now you can blow, blow that all away with a Facebook page. And Facebook's not perfect because obviously they control the algorithm. They control whether or not you can communicate with your own fans. But if you have zero money for startup, start with social media and start connecting with people. Today, FreedomWorks raises about 40% of its total budget online from almost 90,000 individuals. The biggest challenge for starting a libertarian organization five, ten years ago was finding the donors to fund it. We're getting to the point where social media, it doesn't self-fund, but it's going to lower the, the, your ability to, to get going. And once you start doing stuff, once you win your first campaign, even if it's getting the right op-ed in the right newspaper, then you can take that to your donors and say, look what I just did. So I, I would absolutely start with social media, and I guarantee you, Virtually everybody in this room knows more about it than I do, so what are you waiting for? Aha. Um, hi, my name's Viv Regan, um, managing editor at, at Spiked, an online publication, a freedom-loving one as well. I was, I'm so sorry I missed most of your keynote speech because I was really interested in it. And it was your title that said, don't hurt anybody else. Because in um, England, where I live, the harm principle of uh, meal has expanded so much now to mean so much that we can, I think I'm assuming in this room we see how much our freedoms are taken away, our free speech is taken away because of that. So I'd be in really interested to hear what you think about that. I, could, I think we can even say it's happening in the US in universities. Um, and how you combat that because you can no longer these days just sort of say man up or talk about meals a lot. So how do you do it? That's a great question. There's, first of all, there's strength in numbers and it's safer to be one of us when there's more of us. And it's, it's a little bit like the buddy system. Um, there's, a, there's a guy that I think is one of the smartest guys in terms of this brave new world of, of internet and his, his name is John Perry Barlow. He happens to be the lyricist for the Grateful Dead, which, which only qualifies him even more. He was a, he was a um, Republican organizer for Dick Cheney too, so figure that all out. Um, today where we're at is you have this, this huge decentralization and more and more people discovering for themselves what they, what they believe. And then you have things like the, the NSA, and the fact that in the United States, every single American has had their phone metadata spied on since 2006. Every single American. And John Perry Barlow talks about this, and he's, he's, a, he's an internet romantic like I am, and he thinks that, that granular surveillance and the, and the tools that the internet has enabled the government to have is a huge problem. And the only way to combat it is, I mean, I hate to quote you, but, but not just man up, but, but organize. And I hate, I hate to use this example, but I think it's relevant. Um, the, the protesters in Kiev, have you, have you watched the, the, the studies of how they organized through Twitter and Facebook 
and how they were able to protect themselves against, against murder, basically. Um, a lot of people died in that process, but that just couldn't have happened a couple years ago. So I think we need to figure out how to be better than they are. And I don't have all the answers to that because they have more resources, but, but I, don't, I don't see another choice. So I'm uh, Axel Kaiser from Chile, and it's a personal question. I'm uh, on the in, the in this battle of ideas in Latin America, which, as you can imagine, is very discouraging sometimes. And um, it seems never to end, and it never ends. But my personal question to you is, uh, how, do, how did you get through it? I mean, um, you sh for sure had to experience lots of uh, bad times and people, uh, you know, attacking you all the time and maybe defamating you and all these sort of things. So people who are the face of this, of this movement, like you and the public intellectuals, I mean, how did you uh, face all these challenges on a personal uh, level? That's what, what's more interesting to me. Thanks. If you Google my name on the internet, you'll read some pretty interesting things about me. Um, so when you're, when you're interested, have fun with that. You know, I, I, think, I, think, I think a lot of the people in this room face a much bigger challenge than anyone in the United States ever has, because we've, we've gone through a lot. Um, we've had lots of personal betrayals, lots of personal attacks. But up until this point, our lives have not been in danger. I think a lot of people in this room, when you take on your governments, when you take on the political class, this is not an academic question. This is a serious fight. Um, I can only repeat what I said earlier. There's strength in numbers, and there's more of us than there are of them. That's the only way we win. Mr. Matt Kibbe of FreedomWorks, everyone. Thank you. Only